All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Well, hello, hello. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you all for joining Switch Colorado this evening for Switch Up Decarbonizing Transportation. To the Switch faithful, welcome back. And for any newcomers, we officially anoint you switchers. Fair warning, in times of Zoom and approaching the witching hour, if my puppy starts barking or squeaking her toys, I apologize in advance. 6 p.m. is normally prime Zoomy time. But getting back to the event, our team here at Switch Colorado is super excited that you all joined tonight and took some time out of your busy schedules. And we wanna thank you all for being a part of this incredible community of change makers. For those unfamiliar with Switch, we are a volunteer run organization with a few event groups across the country with a mission to bring together our community and our colleagues to network and share ideas to advance thought leadership and inspire change for the responsible use of resources. Normally, we'd hope to be sharing some drinks together during this conversation and cheering on our fellow colleagues leading the panel today, but like you, we've had to adjust in times of COVID-19. What we haven't shifted, however, is our dedication to bring an engaging, fun, and informative event to our community. So to get the chat rolling, we'd love to get to know you all and we encourage an interactive event. So please go ahead and type your name, what you do, and what you feel is the biggest barrier to decarbonizing transportation. Please feel free to direct message your peers as well. And we encourage you to share your thoughts and questions in the chat throughout the event. Questions will be answered during the Q&A session for the last 10 minutes after the panel. And I also wanna provide a reminder that tonight's event is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube page afterwards. Also to only see the videos of the moderator and the panelists, click the up arrow to the right of start video, click video settings, and then check the box that says hide non-video participants. I also wanna share that for those who enter their information or include a question or comment in the chat at any time tonight, we're excited to announce that you will immediately qualify for a giveaway with a winner we'll announce at the end of the event for a free $100 donation to your choice of nonprofit. We'll also be giving away a solar powered charger for those that stay on for the breakout networking session from seven to 7.30 after the panel. As we get started, I wanna remind everyone to please keep your videos and microphones off throughout the panel. And I wanna emphasize again, how incredibly excited Switch is that this event is finally here. And we're super grateful to all of you, to our sponsors, AESP, Drive Clean Colorado, the Alliance Center, the CU Energy Club, and the CU Masters of the Environment program, and especially to our all-star panel and moderator that have donated their time to be here with us this evening. Transportation is the topic of the conversation tonight. And for those that may be unaware, the transportation sector is now the number one greenhouse gas emitter across the entire United States and here in the state of Colorado. It's a critical sector that will need to be decarbonized going forward for to mitigate the impacts of climate change and a prime topic to discuss while the UN Climate Change Conference is currently being held. These folks on the panel and many joining the conversation today, including myself, have dedicated themselves to solving these challenges. And I can't be more excited to pass the Zoom off to our incredible moderator, Jesse Lund. Jesse is a senior associate with RMI's Carbon Free Mobility Team, dedicated to accelerating the clean energy transition and specializing in emissions reductions from heavy duty transport. She works closely with the North American Council for Freight Efficiency to advance electric truck adoption, and her background also includes work on transit bus electrification, charging infrastructure build out, and transportation policy. With that, I'll let Jesse take it away and introduce our expert panelists. Thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate it. It is great to be here. Thank all of you for being here tonight. I know Matt said we can't all share a beer, but it doesn't mean you can't have one at home as you watch along. <laughs> um, thank you to the Switch team for this opportunity to host this conversation. And of course, to all of our panelists who I will introduce here in a second. And just again, to all of you for being here. We have an amazing panel tonight, which I'm sure is what brought you all here. If you're not familiar with each of the speakers on your screen, I'm just gonna give you a really quick background. In no particular order, I'll start with Lang Reynolds. Lang is the Director of Public Charging for North America for Circle K. Lang re recently joined Circle K after six years at Duke Energy, where he led the development and execution of Duke's electrification strategy starting in 2016. While at Duke, Lang also worked in the commercial renewables and M&A organization. Up next, we have a board, oh, sorry, a fourth, who is the CEO and co-founder of WeaveGrid. 
Uh, of course, has dedicated his entire career to furthering innovation in the energy industry across both his academic and his professional experiences. He has worked extensively on the piloting and scale deployment of utility programs across the world. He previously worked at Opower, which is now part of Oracle, the leading demand side management utility software company, where he worked on new products, new markets, and regulatory affairs and was directly involved with programs that were deployed across millions of customers across multiple utilities. Kapoorv also worked at NRG Energy, where he helped develop its behind the meter energy storage strategy and product. And last but certainly not least, we have Navit Singh, who is the Microgrid Labs COO and co-founder. Navit has more than a decade experience in the fields of renewable energy generation, energy storage, microgrids, and electrification of transportation. He has expertise in design and development of distributed energy resource systems, microgrids, solar PV, control systems, and data acquisition systems. And as co-founder of Microgrid Labs, Navit has been involved with design and development of renewable and transit microgrids with focus on conducting feasibility studies and design for campus level microgrids in the USA, including army bases, university and hospital campuses, business parks, cities, and municipalities. So please join me in welcoming our expert panel. I'm gonna start with a fairly easy question for these folks. My first question is, you know, we've seen, obviously we have a very diverse group this evening. Um, including folks representing fueling stations, microgrids, integration with the grid. Um, I'm curious if you could each please say a few words about how you ended up working in the space you're in now, specific to transportation electrification, and what's going on in this space that's most exciting to you? Anyone want to jump in? I'll start off uh, if we're going <laughs> to... We're going to play a, a little uh, standoff here, but uh, yeah, I have to mention I was um, on a red-eye flight last night from California, so if I fall asleep here uh, during the panel, uh, don't hold it against me. Hopefully, we'll keep it uh, nice, and, uh, <clears throat> nice and interactive so that doesn't happen, but uh, in terms of how I ended up here in, in my role at Circle K, um, actually, Jesse, since you're hosting or, or moderating tonight, I'll, I'll share something I don't normally share about my background, which is that I was inspired to get into this business by reading uh, Reinventing Fire back in uh, 2012. So um, I was trying to decide what I wanted to do when I when I grew up and uh, wanted to to work on some big problems like like climate change and was thinking about whether I wanted to go into policy or urban planning or politics or or, or business or, or something like that. And I read that book, which is all about uh, private sector and, and market-based solutions to uh, sustainability challenges and, and climate change. And uh, things kind of clicked and I started thinking more about uh, the, the energy industry and uh, got really, really into, um, <clears throat> into the energy industry and, and went back to uh, grad school at, at CU there in Boulder. So I uh, ended up at, at Duke Energy after I graduated with my MBA. And at the time I, was, I started off in the renewables business uh, which was a little bit, um, it was kind of on the back burner at Duke at the time. So there wasn't a lot of opportunity in, in that area. And uh, they were starting up a transportation electrification group. And I, I put my hand up and uh, was lucky enough to, to get started in that. So um, for me, it, it's really been about um, looking at this, this trend uh, over the course of the 21st century and, and electrification transportation, in my opinion, being uh, one of the largest economic trends that we're going to see uh, this uh, this century and, and wanting to be a part of that. So uh, that's that's pretty much how I ended up here. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Lang. And I will pass that along to our co-founder, Avery Lovins, who is the <laughs> main brains along with a lot of my colleagues behind Reinventing Fire. That's awesome. How about Navi? How about you? How did you end up in transportation electrification? Uh, funny enough, the same book. Yeah, on, on, on a flight from California to here, I, I, I had it and uh, just somehow happened that that night I, I just started reading it and, and that was it. So <laughs> again, reinventing fire. So and we were not paid by Emery Levins for doing this. <laughs> Quick disclosure. Yeah, so so anyways, uh, I, I, I come in from the uh, I'm a mechanical engineer focused on electromechanical systems throughout so uh, had worked on solar panels developing uh, technology on the on the uh, solar side but uh, 
that's a field where where I come from. So having worked on energy generation, storage, and tying that into the grid. So uh, as Jesse mentioned, we've been working on campus level microgrids. So doing large solar projects for campuses and also for some of the cities. So uh, had been focused on this transition of uh, clean electric uh, electricity. And uh, several years ago, we uh, saw the uh, electric vehicle and and uh, uh, general uh, uh, transportation electrification happening. And, and we started looking at it from the technology point of view that as and when the penetration goes up with the number of uh, EVs and also the size of these EVs, if you look at the trucks and the buses, which are really, really large battery sizes. So uh, we started focusing on that, that uh, as and when that happens, the industry would actually need very detailed engineering design and planning done for projects. So that's how we expanded our scope from just having uh, energy generation and storage into uh, looking at it from a system level that now you have uh, uh, buses or medium and we, we mainly focus on medi medium and heavy duty vehicles. So when you look at that, these depots out of which uh, these vehicles operate in today's date, they will, they will need uh, uh, charging infrastructure and, and uh, detailed planning and operations associated with that and, and back that up by uh, further reducing the emission by uh, self-generation using solar and storage and, and reducing the impact on the grid. So, so looking at it from, uh, from a system point of view, so that's how we uh, expanded. And, and uh, personally, I, I just, uh, uh, as, as I said, uh, worked on the solar uh, cell side, that's where I got started and, and the potential of uh, clean energy generation has been on, on my mind for a, for a long time. And now more than ever, we absolutely need it. So excited and glad to be doing this uh, day in and day out. Glad Thank to you so much. Thanks, yeah, Dave. we're very excited to have you here and to dig into a lot of these topics a lot more tonight. Yeah, uh, last but not least, Apoorv, how about you? How did you end up here? What are you most excited about? Oh, what am I most excited about? I, I, I feel like it's, it's, it's so, the whole space is so exciting right now. Everyone thinks they know the answer to everything and nobody actually does. And that's the best part about this space right now. Everyone is wrong and everyone is right. And we're all figuring it out as we go. Um, I, think, I think the thing that's most exciting to us at WeaveGrid is the fact that we're taking two completely independent systems that generally just like never really learned how to talk to each other because they never had to and are bringing them together at such like fast pace that in that systems integration, right? I think we just heard about thinking about it from a microgrid systems perspective and so forth, but in the broader systems integration perspective, there's so much knowledge we're gaining about as more and more people start driving electric about how people behave, how they charge, how they, how they, uh, you know, how they want their vehicles to be fully charged up or not. And, and then of course we get to the inevitable questions that I'll, already start dropping that word vehicle to grid you know there's all that kind of hype that's happening but for me the most interesting and important part right now is like better understanding behavior and from behavior understanding charging and from charging understanding systems impacts and then i think we get into the next stage which is once you understand then you can start to actually control and manage and maybe from there if there's availability you can start to do things like vehicle to grid but it is all about systems integration and it's not just about systems integration. BGI, this term is thrown around vehicle grid integration. I think it's often thought about as a systems integration on the grid, but it goes both ways. Yeah, so, so I, think, I think for us, we've been thinking a lot about just these questions, these bigger questions of how do we bring together these two very, very disparate systems and how do we, how do we make them work and function well together at, the, at that intersection? My, my background actually is interesting. So I, I did not come to this space after reading Amory Lovins. He is fantastic, but that was not my journey here. Um, I, I grew up, uh, I grew up most of my life in the Eastern Mediterranean and sort of saw firsthand what impact in particular our dependency on oil could, could really create from a national security and, and resource, uh, resource perspective. And I think going through that experience, it kind of just seeing firsthand the impacts of things like the Iraq war in the, in the neighborhood and so forth, I think for me, it was, it was eye-opening and just like uh, how much of a problem oil is in both the, in the broader climate question, but also of course, in all these other sort of knock-on effects, whether it be security and so on. And so I think I was actually very drawn from day one to 
reducing our dependency on, on fossil fuels for transportation, that then kind of took a side tour to go towards the grid side of things in my life and, and just saw and, and fell in love with the, the ability to scale impact so quickly through the grid. It is just this amazing machine that allows you to, to you know, whether you're doing energy efficiency like I was or energy storage or whatever, or renewables deployment, of course, it's this amazing tool that can actually scale really, really, really fast. Um, and then with electrification, I just saw this amazing moment where now you could leverage the same grid that we all have such deep, we, have a, we, we rely on it so much deeply. And you could use the same thing to accelerate uh, electric transportation. And so that's, that's how we came to this. And uh, my co-founder had worked at Tesla for several years. And so we kind of put our heads together and said, all right, what do we do here? Very exciting. And yes, it, I will second. It has been amazing to see these two industries that historically really have not worked together starting to come together. I think that's part of why um, it's such an exciting time to be in, in either or really now both of these industries. So I will say working at a climate nonprofit, I get a lot of questions. I'm a lot of fun at dinner parties, right? <laughs> People, everyone wants to talk about climate change, but the flip side is working on an exciting uh, topic like transportation electrification. I think that tends to get a lot more interesting uh, questions from folks. I'm curious, you know, whether you guys are at dinner parties or just talking with friends and family, what are the most common questions that you get asked when you share with folks what you do for a living? And, and how do you respond to those sorts of questions? Maybe the top one from each of you. I would say I, I still keep getting that answer that, hey, do electric vehicles work? Which is, which is kind of surprising, but we still get it. So of course there are issues, of course, uh, uh, it, it's not a silver bullet that fits everyone, but uh, uh, that, that's one of uh, the initial ones and, and people that, uh, have been in this industry. One of the ones that, that I really see uh, is V2G. I, I, I doubt we'll get into it, but uh, that is an interesting one that always comes up. But hey, does V2G make sense? But yeah, so so generally, uh, generally speaking that uh, uh, people want to know more about uh, electric vehicles. And uh, I guess now um, over the last year or so with all the SPACs and uh, EVs being in, in news. So uh, a lot of people are betting on it or uh, at least have come to know about it. But before that, it, it used to be that used to be one of the questions that do they actually work? But yeah, good to see that people are getting educated and and, and that uh, still there, there's a lot of scope there. But uh, um, that's one of the key parts that people want to get educated and know more about it. Definitely. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair question. And I want to meet your friends who know what V2G is, much less have questions about it. <laughs> How about a poor Lang? What questions are you guys getting out there? Uh, I mean, most friends are around here in the Bay Area are like, when do I get my hands on an F-150? Like, they've never driven a truck in their life, but they now want to drive the Lightning. And I'm like, what, why do you want a truck? You don't need one in San Francisco. But yeah, I, I, I think a lot of people are really excited about the fact that there's all these new brands coming out with uh, all these new, the, the, the sort of you know, incumbent OEMs are also coming out with new vehicles. But, you know, living out here in California, like you see a lot of Tesla still everywhere. So it's, uh, it's definitely, I think there's less questions about like, does it work for me than, uh, than probably in some other parts of the country? It's more just like, which one is right for me is more of the question I feel like I hear. Also a good one. Lang, how about you? Yeah, so I'm based in Charlotte, uh, where not everybody has a Tesla yet. So I'm still getting questions like, uh, when is it? Wh when are we going to be able to fill up as fast as I fill up a gas car? And that's probably one of the the most common questions I get. And and actually, I'm I'm taking a, a little bit of a different tact on that one now. So I I think practically speaking, there's really not much difference uh, between a, a gas car and an EV. Um, of course, technically speaking, they don't fill up as fast. We, we can't fill a battery in, in three minutes right now. Um, but practically speaking, the way that somebody lives with an EV is different than a gas car. You do most of your fueling at home overnight. And then when you're on the road, you're normally going to be stopping anyway. Um, I don't know a lot of people that can, that can just drive uh, for hours on end without, without stopping for one reason or another. So I had a, a fun illustration of that this weekend. I was uh, driving here in North Carolina. And I stopped at a fast charger 
there was a family that pulled up right next to me at the same time that I stopped. They went into McDonald's to get um, to get their breakfast, and I was done charging in a little over 20 minutes, and and I beat them uh, back on the road. So I think practically speaking, you know, it's a different paradigm. Uh, the fueling paradigm is different, and and that's um, something that I, I think is pretty much already there. Depending on, uh, of course, what charging network you're using and, and what car you have, and all of those technical specifications, but um, I think we're we're pretty much there. Definitely. Thank you all. So I'm going to move us along because the time's going quickly. But I think one topic on most folks' minds this week is, of course, COP happening in Glasgow right now. We've got world leaders, business leaders, investors, all in Scotland to talk through commitments to reduce emissions. And since we are on this panel talking about reducing emissions, I'm curious, you know, what are you guys hopeful, whether it's out of COP or what would you like to see come out of these sorts of global negotiations? What should we be pushing for from a international perspective when it comes to transportation electrification? I can jump in and, and just put the initial idea, which I guess that's the reason all of us are here, that uh, transportation can be and needs to be clean and uh, the same thing for electricity. And for the last, uh, for the initial days, we saw a lot of discussion about methane as well. So all of those discussions do need to happen, but uh, for the, the focus of what we are talking about here, transportation and electrification, that as, as Apurva mentioned, that these are two completely different uh, industries which are now colliding and coming together. So this gives us a chance to actually solve both the problems in one. So, um, so switching from uh, fossil fuel based transportation to electric and then powering electric by uh, clean sources as much as possible. So uh, that, that's what I, I like to see that having policies, but at the same time, uh, as solid as possible plan to move forward, not just say that, oh, we will do it by the, this year or that year. And then there is no plan and year over year, the emissions are going up rather than going down. So uh, having some, some sort of plan, uh, um, plan and policies out of that. Because it's time to move now, not just sit and talk. Yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll take the, oh, sorry, Jesse, go ahead. No, please, go. I was just gonna say, maybe I'll take the, the as promised, the harsher hot takes. I think, I think a really, really important thing here is that you know, large summits like COP need to create a clear market signal for the automakers to move faster. I think a significant challenge to date has been lots of really uh, brightly colored decks that talk about 2035 commitments for automakers. And when I go to buy one, like ultimately I'm still really looking at Tesla's as the only one that I wanna buy. And so, you know, it's good that F the F-150 is coming out, but it's gotta come out of more than just a trickle. And similarly with every other OEM, we've gotta actually see more and more come out in, in a significant volume. And um, there's a lot that needs to be overhauled, I think from a supply chain perspective. But when you talk to automakers, they're constant, uh, thing is like, well, we just don't know if there's enough consumer demand. And it's like, no, there is, like, get going. So I think the more that there's a bit of a regulatory top-down pressure as well, I think I think that would really help. Definitely, yeah. Definitely second the call for action now and not just far out targets. Um, and you kind of brought up production. Uh, I, I believe there's some production credits or funding for production retooling facilities in the Build Back Better bill that we are trying to pass here in the US. Any, any thoughts from the panel on what you're most excited about in that bill, on what might be missing from that, on things that we should really be keeping an eye on specifically here in the US? So I'll, I'll raise a poor on the spicy takes. Um, I'm actually, <laughs> I've kind of stopped paying attention to the bill. Uh, it's just been, it's been changing so much. Um, the a lot of the elements are I think not very useful at the end of the day practically speaking the tax credit for uh, for vehicle purchases is um, just it's crazy that we haven't found a better policy to incentivize uh, EV adoption at this point than than a tax credit that's uh, 7500 or, or 12,500 uh, for vehicles that are pretty expensive at the end of the day um, 
so I, I think it's it's not great policy, and it's also on the on the infrastructure side. Uh, we've seen some changes in the last few days where uh, market participants, private market participants like uh, field retailers uh, like Circle K, might be boxed out of of getting some of those um, incentives uh, completely. So that's I think that would be a, a pretty poor outcome. Uh, if there's billions of dollars of incentives uh, or funding going out for infrastructure and it's all going to uh, government and, and other entities, I, I don't think that's a, a great result uh, at the end of the day in terms of uh, getting the best bang for the buck for infrastructure investment. Fair enough. And, and I'll bite on that, Ling. Any thoughts on if you were writing the bill, what would you put in there if not a <laughs> tax credit for EVs? Um, well, in, in terms of policy, I just, so the, the lesson for me with the with uh, 30D, the, the tax credit, is just seeing how when Tesla ran out of their tax credit, they just lowered the prices on the cars. So to me, it looks like it's really just going straight to the automakers. And if they already have a, a hard deadline from the ZEV states, uh, the 16 states that have uh, clean car ZEV standards, uh, they have to make those cars anyway. So um, to me, it, it looks like a, a just kind of a handout to the, to the automakers. I, I, don't really think they they need at this point, um, given the the fact that costs have come down on production, battery uh, supply chains have have ramped up quite a bit, and so um, I, I just think it's uh, it, it's a little bit uh, rich in terms of of subsidies at this point. Uh, in terms of policy, yeah, I don't know about my favorite. Um, I don't I don't know what I would do if I was writing it. That's why I'm not uh, in D.C. I guess. <laughs> uh, I'm on oh, business. Fair side. enough. <laughs> How about a nine or a four of any thoughts on the build back better bill? Yeah, I, I generally feel, uh, again, like more focused on the infrastructure side. So excited to see that potentially there will be grid modernization because grid, as we know it, is, is more than 100 years old. And uh, now, and it was never anticipated that this scale of EV penetration will, will happen. So there is a lot that needs to be done on the grid side in order to support it. So I am hopeful that that's done in the right way. And hence the grid modernization and modernization of transportation. And again, like um, same point that, that everything uh, uh, colliding and coming together is a huge opportunity for doing it right. So, so that's one. And, and to Lang's point, and, and um, I'm not focused on policy and, and no way close to even knowing it, not an expert, but uh, I just feel like all these uh, credits and everything that are there for different uh, manufacturers or, or, or whatever it may be, it should be streamlined in a way that the end customer they just see the final price so that all this is already taken out. It's not that difficult to do. It's uh, These are simple numbers so that the end customer knows that, okay, I'm going to pay 21,000 or am I going to pay 71,000? So not like oh, that much. And then, oh, you are in this state and this much and this much and this much. So it, it should be uh, as simple and, and clear and straightforward that if you are giving these uh, uh, reductions or whatever it may be to the manufacturer. So then the end result or that number should be out there. So, uh, yeah, so. Sim so. Simple, straightforward policy. That's a novel idea. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, that's why I'm not a policy maker <laughs> because I, being an engineer, I want things to be simple. So. Well, no, I appreciate that. And I think part of what I was so excited about this panel is, yeah, all of you are representing industry or in the market, not, um, you know, just working behind the scenes on policy. Obviously, the two can work together and hopefully they do. But um, with that in mind, you know, I'm curious, the market obviously is nowhere where we need it to be in terms of what climate science is telling us. But that said, you know, to be optimistic, EV sales did just hit their highest quarter on record, even without any of these new policies passing. I'm curious what folks think are the main drivers for this market that does really seem to be hitting this tipping point. Yeah, so I, uh, I if that's okay, Jesse, I'll take a quick stab at the, the BBB one as well. And uh, also maybe try and blend that into this question right here. So, um, I'm not sure if I want to keep raising Lang on spicy list levels every every question, but let's 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 not do that yet. But um, to start with, I do think so. So our, actually, funnily enough, our head of policy used to be at RMI for many years, and so he he has been thinking a lot about the BBD question. And um, I am grateful overall that we have a semblance of something that looks like a climate bill. 
I think. <laughs> I am glad for that. It is better than not having one in life. I think I'm probably more in Lang's camp about the point that it's not clear how much the bill is trying to activate and push the market really at top, you know, at breakneck speed, which is what we need from a climate perspective versus of course, trying to solve for a lot of other constituencies. I get it. That's how the sausage is made. And that's what we have to do to pass anything, right? So that is the reality of, of policymaking and, and politicking. Um, what worries me a little bit though, is that there has been a, a sort of like uh, narrative of the only problem is that we just don't have enough chargers on those streets or on the roads. And I think that actually like just does not look at real world consumer behavior and how people drive and what they need. What it does is it uses basic studies. It does some like very gas station model thinking and applies it to electric vehicles. As Lang regfully said, we don't have any charger air, anywhere that can charge you as fast as a gas station can fill up your car or your truck. So we shouldn't try to match that. What we should try to do is or think of more creative approaches. And I think we should basically try to say to the market that, look, this is what we need done. This is the level of EVs we want by this date. And here is the funding such that you can go out there and deploy the requisite infrastructure. But I think our definition of infrastructure has to be broader than the box on the ground that is a conduit for electrons to go in your vehicle. It has to be all encompassing exactly as we were talking about earlier about grid infrastructure as well. So we have to be thinking about, you know, what is the charging infrastructure cost? What is the grid infrastructure cost? And what is also just the like, you know, the, 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 the level of understanding that needs to be built to figure this all out. Because I love people who talk about vehicle to grid, like it's something you can just magically activate and tomorrow cars will start spitting power back out. You know, a lot of utilities are just trying to figure out like what their feeder capacities are. Forget vehicle to grid. I mean, if you don't even know what your feeder capacity is, how the hell are you gonna take a bunch of power coming out of vehicles left, right and center? So there's a lot more that has to happen. And I'm hoping that the BBB kind of funds a lot of those efforts as well. Um, so, so I think, I think that's, that's the, the first thing. And then your actual question though, Jesse, if I remember, I don't remember it correctly. So can you remind me what the question is supposed to be? And yeah. I'll, I'll try it. About what's driving this market that seems to really be taking. Right. Yeah. So I think in this case, like at least based on the market data that I'm seeing, like it has gone from just Tesla and you know, vehicles that were frankly made to meet ZEV mandates from a lot of the other automakers to Tesla plus actually attractive vehicles that people want to buy and drive, whether it be the Mach-E, hopefully the F-150 soon, um, perhaps the new EUV from, from Chevy and so on and so forth. And like, and even better versions of the Nissan Leaf, things like that. And I think as we start moving to vehicles that don't look weird and don't feel like something where you're compromising a ton, on, on something like range. I, I, I don't, like I'm an engineer by training too, but I don't love the idea that like, well, everybody only drives about 50 miles a day. So let's design a vehicle that only gives you 125 miles of range. Like that's not how people think. Again, that's not behavior. And so, um, yeah, I think I think that's what's driving it is like, we're actually seeing real use case vehicles on the road and, and I think people want to buy them. They're great. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I want to kind of fall on this thread. You brought up the topic of charging and I've got quite a few questions about charging, actually. You kind of mentioned how the industry has been thinking or at least talking about charging at, from a very kind of gas station. How do we make this ubiquitous charging network um, perspective? And I think it has shown to be not quite as important for some of these EV first adopters, right? The folks who we know for the most part are charging at home almost all the time. That said, I think as the market expands and we try to address some of the equity issues in terms of who has access to EVs, we're, we are gonna need to see some sort of change and less of a focus on relying on home charging. How do panelists anticipate charging behaviors and infrastructure will change as this market takes off? I can start on that. Uh, just to add a little bit on, on what Lang mentioned earlier and Apurva also, uh, also touched on it. 
so this this mentality of uh, uh, the gas station that that's what we had been living on and uh, we were trained on right so so the point that hey i i go to the gas station and in 5 minutes i fill up but now you are saying that the uh, ev is going to take me 45 minutes to an hour uh, that's not feasible but the other way the, the way i try to put it in front of people is that just imagine every morning you wake up your tank is full you don't need to go to the gas station every time you leave your work you're not in today's date but when people used to go to work so every time you leave for, from work your your tank is full so so you don't really need to go and stand at the gas station for 45 minutes or or an hour the point is that it is now easy to uh, charge anywhere but the whole point is that the infrastructure has to be built that way that it is anywhere and everywhere so it doesn't have to be fast chargers because the the grid cannot support it uh, everywhere but it has to be a mix of fast and uh, uh, level 2 and uh, even going down to level 1 so uh, the the number as far as our uh, personal vehicles is concerned we our vehicles are parked about 93 to 94% of our uh, our ownership of a vehicle so from that point of view wherever you are parking if there is charging available that should be good enough so 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 it has to be the 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 mentality has to change but uh, again like uh, it will be gradual but at the same point in time my my thinking is that it has to be slow chargers everywhere and some fast chargers somewhere but uh, if you try to do fast chargers everywhere it's it, it's not going to work okay. Yeah, so we're definitely going to see a mix of of infrastructure, like uh, Matt mentioned. Uh, I would say uh, we're still going to have some fueling stations. So <laughs> I have to give a plug to uh, to the mothership here, and we have some pretty cool uh, stations in in Norway right now. That's our biggest uh, uh, operating uh, area for EVs. Uh, we we haven't released our plans for for North America yet, so um, I can't share too much on that right now. But it it's pretty cool if you go on YouTube and and just uh, search for like circle k uh, tesla bjorn i think is the name of the guy who's done a bunch of these videos there's a, a pretty cool video of our installation uh, with 300 kw chargers uh, solar on the canopies there's battery storage uh, integrated into the into the installation and then of course we've got our our convenience store there as well and it looks a little bit different than the traditional convenience store it's uh, a little bit bigger it's it's nicer inside the food is uh a little bit more in tune with what you'd want to eat if you were sitting there for for 30 minutes so uh, i do have to give a little bit of a plug and, and say that uh, the fueling stations will will continue to exist but uh, they're they're going to look a little bit different uh, in the future i think uh, i appreciate the uh, plug eb pun thanks for pointing that out for us so I've seen quite a few questions in the chat around kind of medium heavy duty vehicles, please. We've been talking a lot about personal vehicles, um, but certainly there are many efforts underway to electrify these larger vehicles. Those who know me know that's what my work tends to focus on. I'm curious, panelists, how do you see electrification coming to these different segments, be it the trucking industry, transit buses, school buses? You know, are there specific sectors that you're most excited about? I'm super excited about school buses personally. Uh, they have been getting a lot of uh, traction. And when I was on the utility side, we, we created some programs for them, uh, which are just now starting to, to hit the market here. So um, yeah, medium and heavy duty, certainly super important from an emission standpoint. Um, I think it's something like 50% of emissions from 20% of the vehicles or something like that. Um, so in terms of the in terms of the impact, it's it's certainly much higher bang for the buck. Um, the, the use cases are different and uh, you, you start getting into the super long haul uh, class eight trucks. That's a pretty difficult segment to electrify. It's probably one of the last that will be electrified, but um, other segments like the like school buses, I think are super exciting. And that's actually, I should mention on, on the Build Back Better, I think there's still money in there for, for school buses uh, to be electrified, which is probably the, the part of the bill that I'm the most excited about. Yeah, I agree with that. We we are uh, very much focused on medium and heavy. So school bus definitely one sector. Transit bus also uh, another one because there are so many of these which do shorter routes, longer uh, uh, longer run time, but but shorter distances. So these are easy to electrify, and uh, there are not as many, but still several options available. So 
so things can move forward one of the things that that i've, I've heard about uh, people saying that if i'm not able to buy an electric vehicle a personal car but i know that the the local city fleet is operating electric bus i would rather uh, ride that if i'm not able to buy and hence help in reducing emissions so that is that is one one key thing the other of course is uh, uh, we are again and again seeing reports coming out that how the emissions from school buses are are uh, negatively impacting the kids so even from that point of view it kind of becomes uh, uh, urgent in order to electrify school buses so again uh, very easy to do uh, if there is a lot of money available of course uh, but uh, technology wise school bus sector is 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 one which is uh, potentially the easiest to electrify and then uh, uh, in the COVID era, we have gotten used to just uh, ordering everything online. So the uh, emissions and everything coming in from all these uh, last mile delivery and even otherwise vehicles. So looking at the commercial sector, again, as, as Lang mentioned, that if you leave the long hauls outside, so other than that, uh, and Jesse, this is your work, I would like to, to get some input from you based on uh, studies that you've recently done. So trucks are also ready, even that sector is ready to electrify. So if there are right policies put in place and uh, uh, funding available, money available, so I think that time is right. We have to start transitioning. So uh, very excited about generally medium and heavy duty. So again, to, to, to what uh, Lang mentioned that the emissions coming from this sector is, is much higher as compared to uh, as compared to when you look at the number of vehicles. But again, the investment needs to be at, at a very uh, high scale. So, so yeah, uh, overall, I, th I think the impact that can be made by electrifying these uh, medium and heavy duty ones is, is pretty high. So that should be focused on. I'm biased, but I would totally agree with you. And, and also agree that a lot of these, even trucks and delivery vans and all the Amazon trucks we see coming down our street multiple times a day now, they are, a lot of them ready to be electrified. Um, though we've got to we've got to be thinking about those long haul trucks too. We can't get to 2030 or 2040 and go, oh yeah, because that is where a lot of the emissions are. Um, Apoorv, did you want to add? Anything? Yeah. Yeah, I think the only thing I'll add, maybe maybe not to be the Debbie Downer here, but it's like absolutely agreed 100% that trucks and buses are the place where we can have a huge amount of emissions impact. I think the thing that we just have to be realistic about is that ultimately like the way, and I apologize if you hear some background noise, slightly loud office even at this time, but like the, the challenge with trucking and a lot of other heavy duty, medium duty vehicles is like OEMs don't actually have the battery supply to go start transitioning those. And at a margin per kilowatt hour basis, they make a lot less margin on a commercial vehicle's battery pack. And we are battery supply constrained. Like we are not in a world right now where we are cranking out so many gigawatt hours of batteries. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're a Tesla right now, you have to make a choice between a Model 3 and a Semi, you're going to put it in the Model 3. You just make a lot more margin. And Tesla actually makes positive gross margins on EVs. A lot of other automakers don't yet. And so I think there is actually a huge business question and a business model transition and just overall like supply chain and so forth question that needs to be resolved. And then we get to the fundamental question of, okay, a truck's a lot of power. How are we gonna put that on? And I'm really glad that people like Namit and Lang are actually thinking about all these things. And, and of course, Jesse yourself, but like, yeah, this is, this is, to me, like we're talking about step two and step three, we gotta fix step one in the MDV HTV problem. Yeah. Totally agree. I think charging, we may think, is slightly more complicated than it needs to be, particularly for some of these early deploying fleets, right? I've seen I've seen delivery vans and even heavy-duty trucks using lower power chargers than some of the DC fast chargers for passenger cars that are out there. So um, definitely hear you, though, and it definitely does need to be addressed. Anyone have thoughts on the supply chain issue? I haven't seen it come through the chat yet, but I know that's on everyone's minds, too. Any, I guess, solutions anyone would offer? How do we scale up um, battery manufacturing, sourcing? I don't this know. This one place BBB a, did I, have a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I think it's the domestic manufacturing side is is super important, especially with the supply chain disruptions that we're seeing right now. So it's it's not my area of expertise, but I, I think that it's something that needs to have more priority here, uh, and and not to get too political given the <laughs> the last five years that we had around tariffs and everything like that. Uh, so I'm not sure what what tools you need to uh, to actually get it done, um, but thinking about batteries and and even. Uh, some of the other base commodities like lithium and, and some of the other metals, um, it, it's it's a much um, much more complicated picture than than just uh, grabbing some some batteries off of a, a ship from China and and hopefully we don't have to rely on that um, exclusively going forward. Definitely. So we've been talking pretty much exclusively about EVs, um, but because this panel is really meant to cover all aspects of transportation, <laughs> decarbonization, uh, you know, not everyone has access to a personal vehicle. We talked about how some folks might choose to ride an electric bus, which is a great decarb option. Um, but many would argue that electrifying vehicles isn't sufficient to decarbonize the sector fast enough. There is a lot of excitement around alternative mobility options, everything from scooters to electric bikes to teleworking options. I think most of us are still working from home these days. Um, what non-EV technology or trend are you guys most excited about? Or is it EVs or bus? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's still an EV, but I'm pretty, I'm excited about e-bikes uh, personally. I, I'm a big cyclist and uh, actually, so here's another uh, factoid I don't normally share on uh, industry panels, but actually I rode a bike to school for uh, for about eight years, like in middle school and high school and was a big bike commuter for uh, for a long period of time before I went to the dark side and, and gave in to uh, driving cars places. But uh, I think e-bikes uh, really open up a lot of uh, possibility for uh, for commuting uh, by bike in areas that are not suited for it right now or people who maybe were a little bit hesitant previously. It, it really uh, flattens the topography and, and makes it easier to, uh, to get around. So uh, still technically an EV, I guess, because they have a battery, but um, I, I think uh, pound for pound, probably a, a more sustainable solution uh, going forward. More healthy as well. Get on the bike, start biking. <laughs> yeah. So, so one of the things which I again, uh, I don't, I don't know where all of this is going to end up, but uh, one of the things that uh, people anticipate and 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 uh, talk about is that private ownership of cars might just go away because you will have all these options so easily available, like with this. Uh, 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 public transit and uh, transport and uh, now uh, the shared bikes shared e-bikes showing up everywhere and of course you have your uber and lyft so so having a mix of all of those options some multi-modal uh, transport options available so people might actually uh, i think we are quite far from there but uh, someday so people might actually not be interested in owning their own vehicles anymore because you don't really use the, use it that much. So, so that is something which which uh, uh, I, I keep uh, thinking about and, and looking at. But uh, so far, uh, doesn't make hundred percent sense. But I think we are going in that direction. Yeah. As somebody who grew up in Europe, I will I will counter that point with the fact that I have recently given up my EV and it is breaking my heart and breaking my bank account because Uber and Lyft are not a sustainable way for us yeah. to continue traveling, especially when you live in a city like San Francisco, which claims to have public transport but doesn't. So my favorite way of moving around and has always been has been trains. I wish we had better trains and better public transit. And you know that's I think to me it's been one of the biggest tragedies of COVID is that so many of our municipal transit authorities have been truly devastated by, by the, the budget shortfalls and so forth. And so um, I hope that we continue investing in those. It's, it's really tough in, in the US, like we haven't done a great job of investing enough in our public transit systems, but it's just so, so efficient and so good when it works. And so I, um, I as, a, as somebody who does not have a car, it is, it, I, I, the last four months of not having a car have been really hard. Like, kind of want a car again. It's going to be an EV again, but it's just it's it's been really hard. 
Yeah. Yeah. Again, so again, I think giving I up your vault before. Yeah, Lang was going to buy my vault, and then he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong color. Can't, can't do it. Uh, I know we're getting close on time. I do want to get to some of these questions. I've seen a few versions of this, and I actually was going to raise it myself as well. The short version is, what do we do about resiliency? And the long version is, you know, we're trying to decarbonize this sector in part to deal with climate change, but we know that climate change is not this future thing anymore, right? It's here, and we are seeing increase in natural disasters, whether it's what happened in Texas with this unprecedented um, cold storm coming through and the grid going down. You know, we've seen rolling blackouts and brownouts in California where utilities out there have had to turn off the grid basically to keep folks safe. Um, you know, the hurricanes that have been coming through, I could go on and on and name all of these natural disasters, but seeing as how they are making headlines more than ever, I think a lot of folks who might otherwise consider EVs are very worried about what happens if and when the grid does go down, how can I charge my vehicle? Um, and that's true not just for personal vehicle owners, but also fleets, whether it's trucks who need to be moving emergency goods or actual emergency vehicles who need to be um, delivering services, goods, um, yeah. Uh, getting people out of dangerous situations. I think there's just a lot that goes into this. I think one of the comments we got in the chat was around what happened here in Colorado this past summer where I-70 was closed due to landslides. Um, folks had to take a three to four hour detour through rural Northwest Colorado. And um, there were some rural towns that maybe only have a couple of chargers that can barely support their own residents charging their EVs, let alone EVs from a highway detour. Um, just considering all of these issues, again, I'll sum it up in resilience, but what policies or best practices would, in, best practices would ensure more resiliency um, for communities, including these rural communities? So I'll, I, I can start on that uh, because we, we focus on, on that aspect of the market. So one of the key things is that Till three or four years ago, when you went and talked to anyone about resiliency, they were like, oh, we have grid. It's never going to go out, right? And now it's happening again and again and again and again and again. So, uh, so the first thing is that now that need is coming up. So people are realizing that, hey, this is a problem. And exactly to your point that uh, uh, to discuss it. So uh, again, comes to that point that this uh, uh, build better uh, uh, Potentially, you have to look at all of these things and, and uh, take resiliency into, into consideration, which was never done before now. So again, uh, uh, to that point that now EVs and, and, and the grid actually has to be thought about uh, transportation and uh, uh, electricity has to be thought together rather than separate. So, so that's where like uh, there are several options and again, use case dependent, but uh, uh, fleets are looking at having their own solar and storage and natural gas and diesel and whatever the backup to the backup to the backup may be uh, in order to be able to support their uh, uh, their fleets that absolutely need it. And, and uh, the utilities are looking at setting up resiliency hubs around the cities so that the community can, uh, uh, can uh, um, benefit from that. And now the discussions are going in that direction that uh, what about EVs that uh, should we actually set these resiliency hubs in such a way that people can actually come in and, and charge their cars. But the other side of it also is that now these, uh, 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 if there is an EV in every garage, so it's basically battery on wheels. So now you have potential of storing energy uh, anywhere and actually move it from uh, one place to the other. So um, again, question, uh, discussion goes in several other directions, but the reverse flow or, or V2G or V2 uh, building or V2 home or V2X, uh, it just op opens sev several options. But, uh, but the, the utilities are thinking about it now, which was never thought about earlier. Transportation sector is bringing up challenges, but everyone is thinking about that. So that, that is a good thing that there is an inclusive uh, uh, discussion going as far as all of these are concerned. So there, there is no silver bullet, but uh, people are thinking about it and working towards it. So distributed generation and, and all of it. So, okay, I won't go into detail. <laughs> yeah. 
I can just keep going on and on. But but yeah, overall, I I think that key point that uh, all of these have to be thought about it uh, uh, in an inclusive and a system level. So uh, discussions are going in that direction, which I'm glad to see. Yeah. Thanks, Nana. I know you'd have a lot to say on that one. It looks like Lang and Abhor do too. So I'll let you guys get in uh, your your last comments here before we turn it back over to Switch. <laughs> Lang, you want to go first? Yeah, I was just. Uh... Yeah, just real quick, was going to say as as far as the narrow question about things like the the I seventy closure, or, um, other uh, uh, short term events that are pretty unpredictable. I think that's a, a natural place for utilities to step in. My my former colleagues on the utility side, um, they get a lot of flack for um, not moving quickly with these disruptive technologies. But I think those kinds of situations where you have something, it, it probably wouldn't be used um, more than a few days out of a year, but uh, it, it's very important when it does need to be used. Uh, so having some kind of mobile fast charging solution for those kinds of, uh, whether it's a, a wildfire related outage or a, a landslide or uh, these kinds of unforeseen challenges, I think that's a, a natural fit for, uh, for a utility to step in and, and play that role. Um, as far as the, well, we're short on time, so I'll let Apoorv go, go ahead. <laughs> no, I mean, it's funny. I, I, I'm, I'm actually going to very much echo what the two other gentlemen said here. I mean, it, it, it's exactly right. And I think, so I'm going to echo the point about taking a systems oriented view. Resiliency now affects mobility, right? Let's forget about energy value of EVs. Let's forget about all that. Resiliency now affects your mobility. And so for that reason, the one entity that has generally been entrusted with providing resiliency solutions for other life, like life affecting moments and decisions, right? Have been utilities. There are programs that utilities run for folks on oxygen support and things like that, that again, kick in resiliency and backup solutions, working with partners like Nunnan's company. Like, I think there, there has to be somebody who can take that systems oriented view. And we've actually been working with quite a few of our utility partners recently on thinking about how you build resiliency into the broader value framework of vehicle grid integration. And yeah, sure, the natural tendency is to look towards technology solutions of, hey, can I do vehicle to home and things like that? Of course, that's a part of the answer. And that's a really exciting part of the answer. I think the other question though, is thinking broadly, like what moments, at what moments and how do you communicate with drivers that there is gonna be an issue? Can you avoid drivers panicking and finding out that their car isn't fully charged? Can you actually, you know, especially if you have somewhat of a heads up, like with things like, for example, in California, we have PSPS events. You have good enough heads up on the fact that a PSPS event is going to happen in the next two days. Well, could you maybe charge those people up? Um, and so there are things like that that I think actually can enhance your resiliency. And and the reality is we're moving to a, a, a changing, into a changing climate. And, and there's no reason for, resi there's no reason for us to like actually lose trust in EVs. It's just that we have to change the way we think about our, our behavior, that's it. And so I, I'm a big fan of actually working with utilities on this because they are used to thinking about broader resiliency questions. And it's just a matter of how they now start communicating about the mobility aspect. Awesome, thank you. Thank you all of you. I cannot believe an hour has already flown by, but it, it is time for me to turn it back over to Matt. Um, don't go anywhere, everyone. We are gonna have some networking coming up. Um, but thank you again to all of our speakers. We really appreciate you participating and sharing your perspectives this evening. Matt, over wow. to you. Wow, yeah, you know, I just want to express that that was an awesome conversation. And I especially want to specifically apologize for the Zoom bomb that occurred earlier in the meeting. We have never had any instance like that happen before. I am shocked by it. And I just want to express how sorry we are that that occurred, both to Apoor, to the rest of our panelists, and to all of our attendees, I think it's, you know, a reflection of just how much work we truly still have to do in our society. And as a community, I know we are fully focused on working towards combating those voices. Um, I want to deeply express that here at Switch, we are a welcoming community and we have the utmost respect for each other and for our community at large. I know for me, it makes me that much more determined in the work that I'm doing. And I know those on this call feel the same. We incredibly appreciate you all being here this evening and again, we can't apologize enough. I also would like to give a specific shout out to Jesse, our moderator, in regards to the topic of discussion today. Transportation is a huge wide ranging issue 
It's a systems issue, as Zapur mentioned in his last comment, from the vehicles to the fueling and charging infrastructure to now the involvement of utilities and energy generation and storage, microgrids, possibly using vehicles as distributed batteries, thinking about resilience and demand management, as well as capitalizing on as much renewable energy capacity as we can to charge electric vehicles going forward. And we pulled together three experts from various industry roles into a conversation that was moderated incredibly. So thank you so much both to Jesse and to all the panelists for making it an easier to understand conversation around a complicated topic. And thank you all to those who tuned in as well. Uh, we do still have a networking event right after this. So please remain on and join us for that so we can all have a chance to meet and talk more about any questions or remaining thoughts. Uh, that's also where we'll be giving away a solar charger. So we hope to see you all there. And I also wanna announce that Bryce Carter, you're the winner of a free $100 donation to a nonprofit of your choice. So Bryce, we'll send you an email after the event to connect and make that donation on your behalf. I also want to announce that the organization that I work for, Drive Clean Colorado, will be hosting a future EV workshop for anyone considering an EV or with questions about electric vehicles, whether that's about vehicle models, incentives, charging, anything you'd like to ask. If anyone is a group or an organization, community, workplace, we're happy to provide a workshop with the whole group as well. So if that's the case, send me an email, uh, which I just added to the chat. And Thank you all so much again. Uh, it will be. It was an amazing conversation. We're looking forward to the networking in just a moment. Oh, can I actually give a shout out for something we're working on in Colorado? If you live in Colorado, if you if you live in Colorado and you drive a Tesla, sign up for the Charging Perks program. We're working with a bunch of automakers in Excel Energy, and basically using excess wind energy that would otherwise be curtailed to charge your car. So it's you have to go Google it. It's called Charging Perks Excel Colorado. It's pretty cool. Awesome, thanks for mentioning that, Apoor. We're uh, gonna break everyone into breakout groups for the networking session. So, um, you know, please stay on and join. Thanks you all for tuning in today. <laughs>